Hi guys, yours truly Megan here and welcome back to the channel. Now I have done a video on tips, not rules, that I follow when decorating my own home. I call them tips because I don't believe in rules and how much I don't believe in rules, I'm going to show you in this video. Join me as I challenge traditional design norms and break nine interior design rules that you should also consider breaking. Let's get started. I believe breaking interior design rules can um, lead to stunning results and unleash your creativity. The concept of only do this and that is not allowed just puts you under stressful limits. And furthermore, strictly following design rules can stifle your personal style and expression. Number one rule to break, matchy matchy symmetry. You do need a symmetric balance, but nothing is written in stone that symmetry is identical twins. Look at my fireplace. I have a symmetry in color and position of the objects, i.e. the spun chair and the Miles Davis artwork. Gives visual balance and contemporary contrast to the very old fireplace surround and mirror. And I gave up the notion of having identical nightstands. I was making myself crazy thinking it was wrong in having different ones. Off to number two rule to break. Talking about nightstands, according to rules, mine are too low. Rule is at least the height of your mattress and not more than two inches higher. My old nightstands, which my husband still has one of them on his side, is 40 centimeters high, and our mattress is 55 centimeters high. My new nightstand on my side, remember, I got away from the matching nightstands, is 45 centimeters high. I like that my nightstand is lower. When I go to set my drink down, I like that I have to lower it down. I know how clumsy I am. If the table was just as high or a little higher, I know I would constantly bump the edge of the table with my glass and wine or whatever would go flying everywhere. I have to go with what is practical for me. I like that they are lower and out of the way of the immediate vicinity of the mattress. And my hubby does also. Moving on to number three. Staying with things too low. Someone, another designer or influencer who has no thought of their own would say my dining room light is too low. Okay, maybe that was a little mean this day, but okay. <laughs> anyway, again, the rule is when your ceilings are eight feet or 2.4 to 2.5 meters high, you should hang your light at least 30 inches or 75 centimeters over the table. And for every extra foot of ceiling height, add three inches. In theory, the light should be between 30 to 36 inches above the table surface. The lowest element of my lamp is 52 centimeters, around 21 inches above the table. As I was designing that lamp, I did not want to sacrifice my design because of some rule. The low height does not bother me or my guests. Believe me, I have asked. Also the rule of not hanging it too high, uh, following the belief that the lamp should be close enough to work as a complete cohesive design with the table. Yes, that is true. But if you have a ceiling lamp that has an over intricate design that spreads out wide over the ceiling and you see it as an art element on the ceiling, then hang it higher if you wish. Okay, starting with number four. Okay, I can feel myself getting a little warm. Wait a second. Yeah, I can feel my face getting a little warm because this one really gets to me as an avid art and photography collector. The height I should hang my art. I have limited wall space and want to utilize every inch, centimeter, whatever. I take my inspiration from art museums and galleries where they take much thought in the curation and hanging of artwork, giving visual, captivating enjoyment from top to bottom, from left to right. I have artwork hanging high over doorways. 
And yes, I have artwork sitting on the floor or on a small stool leaning up against the wall. And from this example from another designer, I am not the only one breaking this rule. Again, I know I keep obsessing about the artwork. What I am immediately um, struck with is how, and if I had enough artwork, I would copy <laughs> this so much, is how you've hung things, not just at eye level, of course, but on the floors, in the kitchen too. Like right. it just kind of is everywhere, the way people almost stack books. Exactly, exactly. Well, one of the reasons is because we run out of actual <laughs> uh, wall, sp wall space. But the other is I, I feel it gives it, um, uh, the house uh, a, a casualness that we we just you know the art is it's not that it's in, in, insignificant but it just feels more casual and it's another way to look at it. Yes, and it gives it a um, kind of more approachable nature. Exactly. As opposed to exactly. people that put their super favorite paintings on a wall with a spotlight on it exactly. in the dining room. Exactly. Here it's like, enjoy it down here. And it does give you a special appreciation and perspective. Yeah, and there's a sense of discovery too. And a sense because, of discovery. Because you start looking there and then you notice, wow, oh, what wow. am I missing on the floor? Number five. This is uh, definitely going to be another controversial topic, like my no TV in my tips video. No backsplashes. I hate them. I could not wait to when it was time to make over my kitchen to take a chisel and sledgehammer and demolish that contractor grade white ceramic tile backsplash. I would not have cared if it was expensive Carrera marble. Okay, I would not have destroyed it. I would have carefully removed it for another use in the apartment, but not as a backsplash. I just don't like the multiple stripes of materials and colors. Your floor is one material or color. If it's wood, if it's tiling, if it's stone, if it's brick, and then your lower cabinets are another material, another color. And then you have countertops, another material. Then you have some kind of tile backsplash or a backsplash of another material. Then comes your overhead cabinets, Maybe they're a different color from the bottom cabinets, even if they're the same, but then take into consideration in between all those other colors and materials are the walls that are possibly also another color or material. Now, if you have a complete accent wall, taking the marble all the way up the wall and maybe only have open shelving, or if it's stone and you can, you don't have to do open shelving. You can also hang over the marble or the stone overhead cabinets. Now if your countertops are wood, so the wood paneling is going up and then again, open wood shelving or open cabinets that match the wood or even metal. That for me is more cohesive and calming. I just lacquered my kitchen walls, making them waterproof and totally wipeable. All surrounding walls and the wall between the cabinet and countertops are the same, reducing what I view as chaos. And I am actually planning on totally color washing my kitchen. So my cabinets and my walls are going to be the same color. Only contrast difference is going to be floor and the countertop. Okay, moving on, number six. Okay, this is not actually breaking a rule, but cheating to achieve it. The rug size rule. Not everyone has the finances to purchase the correct size for the room. You know the rule, that at least the front legs of all your furniture is sitting on the rug. Ideally, would all furniture sit completely on the rug? Or in the dining room that even pulled out and away from the table, the dining chairs are still on the rug. But what about odd shaped or very large spaces that might require something custom? Who has the money for that? I found three antique rugs, different designs, similar base color, and arranged them overlapping like a puzzle to cover my living room area floor. Think Moroccan, Tunisian homes, or Bedouin tents. The rule is a large enough rug 
that the furniture is fully on the rug, but who says it has to be one rug? I didn't pay over 500 euros for any of those rugs and they are absolutely gorgeous antique Turkish rugs I found on Etsy. I've said it before, do not sleep on Etsy when it comes to well-priced, high-quality antique rugs. I will leave some of my favorite rug dealers links down in the description box below. Okay, on to number seven. While we are on the subject of rugs, what kind of rugs are acceptable in the bathroom? We think normally on those terry cloth or wetness absorbing types of rugs, but what about decorative antique wool rugs and runners? It's seen as so impractical. Yeah, and so are many other decor items in my home. You have to find that balance between practicality and impracticality. Regarding the impractical things, are you willing to invest what is needed to protect and care for them? I'm grown enough and my husband also to keep the water in the correct vestibules while bathing and using our bathroom. So I have antique wool rugs in my bathroom. And we have talked about the Murano chandelier in my kitchen, which I do have to invest the time two or three times a year to get up on a ladder, take it apart and clean it because it is in the kitchen and does get a lot of residue from cooking on it. And I have an antique rug in my kitchen also, I am willing to take the extra care, so don't tell me about some rule of thumb for interior design on what belongs or doesn't belong in the kitchen or bath. Talking about what belongs in a bathroom, my new antique wood bar in my bathroom opened up a couple of conversations. Conversations that I totally welcome. I love hearing your opinions. The more, the merrier. We are here to bounce information off each other. This is in no way a criticism. And believe me, I don't, I don't take it myself as criticism. I just want to make sure you are not being too much influenced from what others are telling you isn't correct or what you may have learned growing up. Meaning, you know, what your parents or grandparents did or did not do when it comes to home decor. Some were concerned uh, with the wood and the damaged moisture may cause. Wood has always been used for under the sink cabinets. Then it was said they were covered with veneer for the humidity. Not always. Check out this bathroom sink in a hotel where I newly stayed. The wood was clearly only oil to create a raw look. Look how close it is to the bathtub slash shower. And it is fine. And this video will knock your socks off. This is our bathroom. It is adorable. Uh, this is called a coffin tub. I don't know if you've ever heard of one of these, but it basically is wood clad. It's got a copper lining. It's really deep. It is literally the best shower I've ever had. She has a wood bathtub slash shower. Her Victorian home is at least 120 to 130 years old. And that tub is definitely original to the home and it has survived. My cabinet is from 1920. It has survived the last 100 years just fine. It will survive my bathroom and more than likely outlive me. It was also commented that the wheels and hinges may rust. They are already rusted. That was some of the character that I loved about it. And new bathroom cabinet doors have hinges too. Don't let old perceptions hold you back. I repeat, if you are willing to invest the extra energy in taking care of something that may be deemed impractical, then just go for it. I will not be creating tsunami-like bathwater waves soaking the cabinet, and if any liquid skin on it, it will be immediately wiped down. I even take care to see if anything is dripping down my cosmetic bottles to wipe it off to take care of the inside wood and shelves of the cabinet. I do admit it may be just cultural that antique cabinets are commonly used here in Europe in bathrooms, but if you live somewhere else in the world and that is your desired look, then do it. Wait till you guys see what I have further planned for the bathroom. Oh, and the powder room too. Some of you guys are gonna be screaming at me through the screen. But I can't wait.
Let's go on. Took a long time with that one. Number eight, the 60, 30, 10 rule. For those who don't know, that is some rule of guidance given when it comes to the use of colors. You should use 60% of a dominant color, 30% of another, and 10 of a third. This is nothing about which colors. It does not matter the percentage of the colors you use, but the correct colors together. Go back and watch my Find Your Living Room style video where I teach you how to use the color wheel. And let's look again at a pic I showed you from Sarah Story's book. This picture has what? 90 to 95% red orange and five to 10% turkey's color, but yet it is so pleasing. Why? Because those colors complement each other based on scientific color theory. Colors that complement, balance each other, and cancel each other. Your eye and brain are stimulated from certain color combos. So it is scheißegal, and that is German for it doesn't matter a F, the percentage of color combination you use, but which colors you combine. Please, if you guys don't take anything else away from many of my tips on this channel, please at least color theory. Okay, and lastly, number nine, the number of unmatched or different metals used in a room. Apparently the rule is two. I guess I was taking a cigarette break as they were teaching this rule because almost in every room I used three, a gold color, a silver color, and black. Equally, I may add, not 63rd 10 rule, but I will recommend with chrome, use a darker bronzy gold, like a patent, I, I looked up that word. I don't, I saw patinated, also patinated. I don't know which word to use, but <coughs> a older age type of bronzy gold or unlacquered brass. And with a lighter silver metal, a brighter gold metal. It is similar when mixing precious metal jewelry. Chrome has a darker, rich silver nuance like platinum, which looks better with the pure darker hue of 24 karat gold or rose gold. And lighter white gold is complemented better with lighter lower carat yellow gold. And then of course, black goes with everything. Okay, guys, <laughs> I think I got a little riled up in this video, but I hope you enjoyed it and understand your design is you and your personality. Do not rack your brain trying to follow everyone else's rules. Even if you choose not to follow the color theory rule, that is your prerogative. I repeat, your home, your prerogative. You guys, Thank you again from the bottom of my heart for tuning in. And as always, yours truly, Art Macon. I like sitting here drinking wine while I'm uh, recording. It's like a, it's like an old grandpa that's sitting in his chair with his pipe telling yeah, the story. Exactly. <laughs> in between and surrounding all of this, these. Blah! Okay, no sip of wine. Grandpa's telling her story. Is my tongue purple from the wine? Yeah. <laughs>